Okay, I'm going to cover booting at least. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the. So um, the CD-ROM boot sector goes on about block 16 hex. Anyway, uh, my uh, my boot sectors um, they reload. Okay, the the BIOS loads the boot sector at 7C00. Mine copies itself. Mine identifies where it is. It calculates where it currently is, and it copies itself up to uh, a location. Mine copies itself out of the way. Boot high location. Mine boot high location is uh, up in the nine ninety thousands. Okay, so my bootloader copies itself out of the way and uh, uses the BIOS interrupt 42. I'm not messing with anything earlier than a 64-bit. All 64-bit computers have uh, 1342. Where's 1342? 42 is the BIOS uh, code. Interrupt 1342. So I, um, you're asking, how do I use absolute addresses? Well, let's look at my hard disk. That's the one I want to look at. So the hard disk makes it. There's a DAP. This is a. This is a. This is a structure and a structure in memory that has a block address, 64-bit block address, and a count of blocks. And uh, mine, uh, mine, uh, when I install. When when you write the files to the hard disk, that's when you set the the absolute address of the kernel. So it's every time you update the kernel.bin, you have to update the the boot sector. Every time you make a new kernel, you have to update the boot sector. Okay, that's how it works. The CD-ROM, uh, the, it's a little it's kind of easier, more predictable. But anyway. Um, so I have a uh, file find. This will load. This will get the cluster number of a file. If you want the cluster number of a file, so that you can write, then you. Okay, I'm trying for minimum line count. Why would I? Why? Okay. So my so my kernel navigates the FAT32 file system, right? My kernel has to navigate the FAT32. Why on earth would I put navigating the fat into the hard disk that's stupid the hard the bootloader why would i put navigating the fat into the bootloader when i install i just use my existing navigate the fat and then i just write an absolute address and i store it contiguous i store my kernel contiguous so um, this is the minimum line count. If I duplicated all these lines of code, my line count would go up, wouldn't it? That's just dumb. So in my install routine, when you make the operating system, when you make make all, make OS partition boot install, that 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 makes the. There's only two files. It's kind of a joke. There's compiler and kernel. Make so it it compiles the compiler and kernel, and then it writes into the installs it, it installs into the boot sector it sets the dap block address it calls a uh, file find like I told you and it gets the cluster um, converts a cluster to a block and then uh, writes the boot sector so uh, I was gonna say something uh, okay so the first so the kernel dot bin, the kernel, when you compile the kernel, this this is the the make file. It's a joke. It's just including code. We don't have a make file. It's that fast. It can it can compile everything in half a second. So you don't even need a make. Um, so uh, you don't need object files. Um, I'm limiting it to a hundred thousand. It's 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 always going to be small because I'm limiting it. Anyway, so. Um, the kernel make file puts it goes in the order of this file 
So um, K start is the first. I forgot to tell what the bootloaders do. Um, so the bootloader, cop the bootloader identifies where it's located, and it copies itself up to the ninety thousands, and then it uses the 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 already absolute address of the kernel, um, uh, absolute address of the kernel dot bin. It loads it um, one block at a time, and then it jumps to boot RAM base. This jumps back down to 7C, so it loads back into 7C after it's uh, moved itself up to 90,000s, and um, then it jumps it jumps to the start of the kernel, and the kernel bin starts with the header, and then it's the the, the kernel start. So this is now what. Okay, class, we're in real mode. Did you realize that? I'm not doing UFI. UFI. They're going to support me. I'm not supporting them. They just they use ELF and they use graphics file formats. It's totally fucked up for me. So I'm 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 just going to command everybody that from now on you can only reduce God's temple, not line count. So this is the this this is called in real mode by the boot loader. It skips its, it has some data structures here, the GDT, you guys love that, don't you? Ooh, ooh do you know what a GDT is? Ooh, ooh, I did that in 93, folks. Anyway, uh, so uh, you guys are not using 16-bit. A 16-bit has twice as wide of entries, and guess what? Uh, I I um, have to pass through... I. I start in six real mode, and I change to protected, and then to long. So I start in real mode, then I change to protected, and then I change to long. But I do a trick. I uh, um, the the I skip every other entry so that um, it works for both real for both protected mode and long mode. So in other words, I I uh, I use the same GDT for protected and long mode. Because they're they're bigger, everything's bigger in long mode, except the TSS. That's kind of all different. Anyway, the TSS no longer holds the registers. You don't have a push all. Um, anyway, um, so uh, so when my kernel boots, this is real mode. It calls interrupt ten to change to VGA. To change to 640, it calls memory E820 to get the memory map. This is still in real mode. My kernel has been loaded, and it's still running in real mode. Um, I made my assembler be able to do 64-bit, 32-bit, and 16, but my compiler only does 64-bit. Um, did you know it's easier to do a 64-bit compiler because you have more registers? It's much harder to do a 16-bit compiler because you have fewer registers and um, you have segmentation. My my assembler does not do segmentation. It only does limited 16-bit. So now we're we enable eight e820. I don't I don't. Brendan at OS Dev gets really carried away. Mine is six. Mine only works in 64-bit computers, so I don't have to worry about all the weird ones um, anyway um, so here's where I set up my uh, my GDT this is what a person was asking about there's the the limit of the um, data segment limit of the code segment in long mode um, the limit doesn't matter the base the base is zero for DS and CS the only one that mat the only segments that are functional in long mode are uh, FS and GS, and those you have to change with the model specific register. Um, actually, I'm not too sure. I think you might have to set these up. I don't remember, but you, you can't change them. They're set, they're locked on zero. Um, anyway, uh, then you make a pointer to your GDT, and then you load your GDT, then you change your CR0. And this, my friends, is this. Okay, and we jump to 32-bit. Uh, 
Now, when when I do a fast reboot, I buy I I I don't go all the way back to real mode. I have a, a fast reboot that just in, refreshes my structures. Um, so this is a 32-bit. So we're doing some stuff. I have a my compiler has a table of absolute addresses in the code that have to be patched. So my code has to be patched. It's all it's uh, all the addresses have to have 7C added to them. So while we're still in assembly, before we're doing the, the, the C code, we go through the table and we patch all those addresses. Um, and um, I have all the symbols. You were wondering how I had my symbols. Well, anyway, um, now we're, uh, we set up the heap. We have to have that set up. Well, we have to initialize a memory to identity map. Um, I can't do that in C because um, I only have a 64-bit compiler, so I have to do this in assembly. So um, I initialize it to identity map. Guess what? I map it with 2 meg blocks instead of 4K. You can use either 2 meg or 4K, and I use 2 meg, except for the first block because I have VGA. There's initializes the floating point unit, saves a copy so that we can have a standard. Um, then it uh, initializes my CPU structure. Um, and oh, where did we call it? We, here, we switched to 64-bit mode. I went ahead and made that a subroutine. Um, this, is, this is where you switch to 64-bit mode. You uh, set up, I don't know what that is. Um, I don't remember what it is. Um, my assembler has funky, uh, I, I didn't make, uh, I do limited support for those instructions uh, to save to save save me effort. You don't need to anyway. Um, so I load the page table into CR3. Uh, this is where you change write model specific. This sets it to 64-bit. Enable paging. I have to enable paging for 64-bit. I don't know if that. Technically, I think it happens when I think it happens when you do this when you do the jump to a 64-bit code segment. Um, and when you restart the kernel, I can do a fast reboot. Anyway, um, so uh, we uh, the last thing we do after we uh, we we set up we change to 64-bit. I made a run level flag that. Um, you might want to investigate to see all my different... Every time I make an accomplishment, I set a bit in a run level. For, okay, for 16-bit, we set a bit. 32-bit, if it's been patched, if the absolute addresses have been patched, if we've changed to 64-bit, if we initialize the boot heap, if we initialize the full heap, if we initialize raw um, VGA graphics, if we got interrupts up and running, my IDT... If we got multiprocessing going, if we got the disk going, if we got the compiler going, if, if we got the document window document manager going, if the window manager, if we've logged in, um, if we did the registry, and then if we um, if we finished Atom two directory, and then if it's parked in Atom goes into it, the Atom task um, is what is uh, calling all this stuff. And at the end, it goes into Atom. And the the very last thing before these subroutines is it jumps to um, kernel main. So it sets up FS, jumps to kernel main. Kernel main is in CK end. So this is just, uh, now we're in 64-bit C code. So we, uh, we initialize the rest of the heap. We set up the timers, the interrupts, um, set up, calibrate the time, um, set up the keyboard and mouse, uh, initialize block devices. That's the then we uh, uh, load the compiler, and then we uh, we start compiling Atom One. This is like autoexec.bat. So we compile my header files that declare all my uh, headers for the kernel and um, so these are these are where the header files are and then uh, when it's done it goes into the atom 2 directory remember I told you it's uh, the atom gets just in time compiled 
So Atom 2 includes a bunch of files. These, this is 40,000 lines that get compiled um, every boot. So it uh, it sets up the disk, sets up the window manager, um, WordStat, a bunch of stuff. Then when it's done, it goes into your account. Atom 3 is uh, in your account directory. Um, and that's where uh, the rest of the files. And then when it's done, Atom goes into a... Uh, the Atom task go in, goes into a server state where you can tell him commands like print high. Now Adam just printed high. He's he's serving. Um, you can tell him to include code, and that's like kernel memory. That'll be system wide. Everyone gets it, and it never dies. So if you make a wallpaper, you want that kernel memory. So you Adam include your wallpaper. So anyway.